Welcome to the TearSet tutorial video series. This video is part two of a two-part series looking at the use of the land change modeler in TearSet. In this tutorial, you will learn how to model land change using the land change modeler. The land change modeler part one tutorial video explored change analysis using the land change modeler. This tutorial video will focus on the next two tabs, transition potentials, and change prediction in order to model land change and predict future scenarios. For this tutorial, I'll use land cover images for a rapidly changing area of lowland Bolivia. The earlier image is from 1986 and the later image is from 1994. Seven different land cover transitions have occurred in the study area between 1986 and 1994 but I only want to model the most prevalent transitions, so I'll ignore transitions less than 500 hectares. When I use this threshold, only four transitions remain. Next, I need to decide what transition submodels to use in my model. A transition submodel is a collection of land cover transitions which share the same underlying drivers of land change. I currently have four transitions listed here. Woodland savanna to anthropogenic disturbance, Amazonian mature forest to anthropogenic disturbance, savanna to anthropogenic disturbance, and deciduous mature forest to anthropogenic disturbance. The other three transitions that occurred in the study area between 1986 and 1994 were excluded because they did not occur over more than 500 hectares. Each of these four transitions currently has its own submodel. However, based on my knowledge of the study area, I know that the same variables are driving all of these transitions, so I should group these four transitions into a single submodel. To group transitions into a submodel, give the transitions the same submodel name. I'll call my submodel anthropogenic disturbance. Each submodel that you include in your land change model must have transition potentials created for it individually. Since I'm only using one submodel, I only need to create one transition potential. However, other models for other study areas may have two, three, or many different submodels. If you have multiple submodels, you can select which submodel to work with using this drop down menu. The next panel, Variable Transformation Utility, can be used to create driver variables for your model. This panel is optional. Check out the TearSet tutorial or the help system files for more information on using this panel. The Transition Submodel Structure panel is the next panel that must be filled in to create your transition potentials. This is where you specify what variables drive the transitions contained within the submodel you are evaluating. Some common driver variables, particularly when predicting anthropogenic disturbances, include distance from roads, distance from urban centers, distance from prior anthropogenic disturbance, elevation, and slope. Roads can provide access to previously remote areas promoting anthropogenic disturbance near roadways. Urban centers tend to grow and expand as the human population increases, so areas near current urban centers are frequently susceptible to land change. Areas which have already been disturbed by humans often have infrastructure in place that promotes further disturbance along current disturbance edges. Since environmental gradients such as temperature and precipitation change with elevation, elevation is often a good predictor of areas that are suitable for agriculture and thus are vulnerable to conversion to agricultural land. Finally, slope is important in determining whether land is useful to humans. For example, agriculture and building require fairly gentle slopes, so areas with these slopes may be more likely to experience land cover change. The choice of driver variables should be based on your knowledge of the study area. For each variable you include, you must specify its role. 
the role can be either static or dynamic. Dynamic variables will be updated at each time step during the prediction stage of the model. If you choose to include a dynamic variable, you must also fill in the basis layer type and operation cells for that variable. Check out the help system files for details on dynamic variables and how to specify these parameters. I'm going to use seven static driver variables for this model. To make adding multiple files easier, I'll choose to insert a raster layer group that includes the seven driver variables I've chosen to use. The final panel allows you to run your transition submodel to create a transition potential image for the submodel. Transition potentials describe the probability of a particular transition occurring on the modeled landscape and will be used in predicting future change. You can choose to use a multi-layer perceptron neural network, sim weight, or logistic regression to create your transition potentials. Sim weight and logistic regression can only be used to model one transition at a time, such that each transition must also have its own submodel. The multi-layer perceptron can handle multiple transitions at once. Since my submodel contains four transitions, I need to use the MLP method. There are many parameters that can be set for the MLP neural network, and you can learn more about these parameters by reading the help system files or the Tearset tutorial. However, if you choose to use automatic training and a dynamic learning rate, you don't need to modify these parameters yourself. The optimal parameters will be found by the model. Click Run Submodel to train your neural network. The MLP will first select random samples of pixels that went through each transition you are modeling and pixels that could have gone through each transition but did not, also called persistence. Half of these sampled pixels will be used to train the model and the other half will be used to test how well the model is doing at predicting change. You can read more about how the MLP works in the Tearset help system, but essentially the MLP is creating a multivariate function that can predict the potential of a pixel to transition based on the values of the driver variables for that pixel. While the MLP neural network is running, the graph and running statistics will be continuously updated to provide you with information on the predictive power of your model. The accuracy and skill measures in particular are important, as they provide a first look at how well the driver variables you have chosen can predict change. An HTML output will pop up when the model is finished training. This output provides you with information about the MLP model that was created. The first few tables provide basic information on the inputs, parameters, and model skill. Section 3 of the results provides a series of graphs depicting the predictive power, or importance, of each driver variable included in the model. The last graph can be particularly useful. This final graph shows the results of a backwards stepwise constant forcing procedure. The model is first evaluated using all the input variables, and accuracy and skill measures are calculated. Then, the least influential variable is held at a constant value over the study area. If the skill and accuracy don't decrease much, it indicates that the variable is not very important to the model and could possibly be removed to create a more parsimonious model. The next least important variable is then held constant along with the least important variable, and so on. Here, you can see that holding variables 5, 3, 4, and 7 constant doesn't seem to make much of a difference to the model accuracy. I might want to reduce my variables to just variables 1, 2, and 6 in order to create a more parsimonious model. If you wish, you can save or print the results before closing the HTML window. Once you are satisfied with the input variables in your model, click the Create Transition Potentials button 
to make the transition potential image for your submodel. Because there were four transitions included in my submodel, I have four transition potential outputs, one for each transition. These are the transition potential images for my anthropogenic disturbance submodel. Areas in red have a high potential to transition to anthropogenic disturbance, while blue and purple areas have a low potential to transition. Remember to create transition potential images for each submodel you are including before moving on to the Change Prediction tab. The first panel on the Change Prediction tab is the Change Demand Modeling panel. This is where you specify a prediction date. My input land cover images are for 1986 and 1994, and I'll predict to the year 2000. The next panel allows you to set up dynamic road development, but we'll skip this panel. Check out the help system files or the Tearset tutorial for information on the dynamic road development tool. The change allocation panel allows you to choose how many stages you want your prediction to be broken into. For example, if I were to choose two stages, the prediction would be broken into two equal time steps between 1994 and 2000, and two predictions would be created, one for 1997 and one for 2000. If I chose three stages, I'd have outputs for 1996, 1998, and 2000. If you included any dynamic variables in your model, they would be updated at each time step. I'll stick with just one stage for this demonstration. There are a number of other parameters you can specify on this panel. Again, you can learn more about these options by reading the tutorial or the help system files. Click Run Model to create your land cover prediction. You will get two outputs, a hard prediction and a soft prediction. The soft prediction depicts the vulnerability of each pixel to transition to a different land cover class during the time period you specified. Areas in red have a high potential to transition, while areas in blue or purple have a low potential to transition. The hard prediction predicts a specific land cover class for each pixel. Finally, you can evaluate the accuracy of your prediction using the validation tab. All you need is an image of the actual land cover for your predicted year. The validation output will show misses, false alarms, and hits, and can be used to evaluate the skill of your model. There are many features of the LCM application that weren't covered in this tutorial video. For details on these features and more information on those features that were covered in this video, check out the Tearset tutorial. The tutorial can be accessed by going to Help, Tearset Tutorial. Tutorial Section 4 covers the Land Change Modeler in detail. If you missed the Land Change Modeler Part 1 video, you can find it and other tutorial videos by going to Help, Tearset Tutorial Videos.